on World News Tonight. Energy outage. Global economies cripple in the face of a power scramble. Royal backlash. Prince William slams space tourism and says billionaires should focus on saving Earth. Endorsing boosters. FDA has given the green light to Moderna's booster shot. New heights. A new chair made in France now allows everyone to try the adventure. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with the scarcity of energy. A world energy crunch is expected to boost oil demand and further stoke inflation, likely slamming the brakes on the global economy recovery, according to warnings from the International Energy Agency. A warning Thursday from the International Energy Agency. The energy watchdog warns a global energy crunch is likely to boost global oil demand by half a million barrels per day, and that's enough to stoke inflation and slow the economic recovery. This red flag comes just days after the International Monetary Fund cut its global economic outlook for the year, due in part to inflationary pressures. Oil and natural gas prices have soared to multi-year highs recently, with crude oil in the $80 a barrel range on global markets Thursday. Power prices are at record highs, with widespread energy shortages hitting Asia and Europe. Some countries have responded with rolling blackouts, and that's likely to stymie industrial activity adding another ripple to the economic recovery. The IEA upgraded its global oil demand forecast for this year and next at a time when stockpiles in oil-consuming nations are already at their lowest since early 2015. Making matters worse, OPEC Plus is in no rush to pump out more oil. Prompted to slash production last year in order to avoid a price crash during the health crisis, the group has only returned a fraction of that oil to the market. On Thursday, top oil producer Saudi Arabia dismissed calls for OPEC Plus to boost oil output even more. Without a boost in supplies, the IEA predicts oil demand will continue to outpace supply at least until the end of next year. Gunfire killed at least six people in Beirut as supporters of the Shiite group and Hezbollah and its allies gathered in the Lebanese capital to protest against the judge investigating last year's catastrophic port explosion. Gunfire in the Lebanese capital of Beirut killed several Lebanese Shiites on Thursday. Authorities say the attack was aimed at protesters planning to participate in a demonstration called by Hezbollah to demand the removal of the judge investigating last August port explosion, whom they accuse of bias. The catastrophe killed more than 200 people and devastated swathes of Beirut. Local television footage showed bullets bouncing off buildings and people running for cover, scenes reminiscent of the 1975 to 1990 civil war. Civilians were evacuated from buildings close to the gunfire, Witness said that at a nearby school, teachers were telling children to lie face down on the ground with their hands on their heads. An army statement reported that the gunfire had targeted protesters as they passed through the Tayuna traffic circle, an area that divides Christian and Shiite Muslim neighborhoods. According to a military source, shooting began from the Christian neighborhood of Ain el Ramana before spiraling into an exchange of fire. Hezbollah and its ally, the Shiite Amal movement, said groups had fired at protesters from rooftops aiming at their heads. It claims the attack was aimed at dragging Lebanon into conflict. The army deployed heavily in the area, saying it would open fire against any armed person on the road. Hezbollah's Al Manar TV said two martyrs and a number of wounded had been taken to a hospital in the Shiite southern suburbs. Bursts of gunfire were heard for hours with several explosions, seemingly rocket-propelled grenades fired into the air. The shooting marks some of Lebanon's worst strife in years. Political tensions have been building over the probe, and the standoff over Judge Tarek Bittar's investigation is diverting the newly formed government's attention away from addressing a deepening economic crisis. 
Japan dissolved its parliament, setting the stage for an election at the end of the month that will pit the new Prime Minister Kishida against an unpopular opposition in a battle over who can better fix the pandemic-battered economy. For more on this, we have other there in a World News special correspondent Anjali Vijayaratna reporting now from Fukuoka in Japan. Anjali. Yes, Andradi. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida told a news conference that the intent to deliver a bold stimulus package worth several tens of trillions of yen in an effort to help the country's economy recovery from COVID-19 pandemic. Kishida's party is promoting his push for coronavirus measures including supplying an oral antiviral medication this year, as well as his vision of releasing a new capitalism that focuses on economic growth and redistribution of wealth. Kishida reiterated at the new conference that government plans to start admi administering booster shots from December and pledging to strengthen Japan's hospitals and its testing capacity. The ruling party has also called for a sharp increase in defense spending to occur that capability to destroy ballistic missiles amid China's increasingly assertive posture over Taiwan. Kishida also said he wants to start in-person diplomacy as soon as possible, starting with President Joe Biden of the United States, Japan's most important military ally. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you. That was Adi Derna World News Special Correspondent Anjali Vijayaratna reporting from Fukuoka in Japan. Over in Taiwan now, a fire has broke out in Kaohsiung with the building set ablaze. More than 46 lives were lost as rescue operations continue. Authorities fear the figures could rise further. A massive fire engulfed a 13-story residential building in Kaohsiung, southern Taiwan on Thursday, killing at least 46 people and leaving at least 41 injured. According to Taiwan's official central news agency, the fire broke out at around 3 a.m. and quickly spread throughout the commercial and residential complex. There was a boom noise and then there was fire. The power lines may have been outside. These few days, there have been boom sounds from the power lines. The local fire department has said that while the cause of the fire is still unclear, an investigation is underway based on reports that it was burning intensely in a pile of debris on the first floor. CNA reports that local police are not ruling out what they called human factors. Around 75 vehicles and more than 160 firefighters were dispatched to the scene. The fire was put out at around 7 in the morning, but search and rescue efforts continued long into the afternoon. 62 people between the ages of 8 and 83 were rescued and taken to hospital. However, the city's fire chief warns that the number of casualties could increase as some people might still be trapped. The mixed residential and commercial building was built over 40 years ago and is home to around 120 households. Many of them are known to be senior citizens with dementia or physical disabilities. Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen delivered her deepest condolences to the victims on Facebook, promising that the government will spare the most efforts in rescuing and resettling them. Prince William has criticized billionaires who are focused on space tourism, saying they should instead be investing more time and money on saving the Earth. Britain's Prince William on Thursday took a thinly veiled swipe at the billionaires competing in the space tourism race saying they should be focused on fixing environmental problems on Earth before soaring skyward. We need some of the world's greatest brains and minds fixed on trying to repair this planet, not trying to find the next place to go and live. His comment, which came during a BBC interview, appeared aimed at Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk and Richard Branson, whose rival rocket ventures are all vying to usher in a new era of private commercial space travel. Fellow Brit Branson, first to launch on his Virgin Galactic, said upon his return that the company was, quote, here to make space more accessible to all. Although at a current price of $250,000 a ticket, that remains to be seen. Bezos was next to blast off, saying his Blue Origin provided a road to space, quote, so that our kids and their kids can build a future. His company is enjoying a PR coup, having just sent Star Trek actor William Shatner to space on its second civilian mission. And SpaceX founder Elon Musk has spoken about trips to Mars. But Prince William, it appears, would rather they bankroll ways to fight climate change, 
given that humans will likely hang around Earth for a while. You know, we are seeing a rise in, in climate anxiety. You know, people, young people now are growing up where their futures are basically being threatened the whole time. It's very unnerving and it's, it's, it's very, you know, anxiety making. The Prince's personal response to the issue has been to create the Earthshot Prize, which aims to find solutions through new technologies or policies to the planet's biggest environmental problems. The first five winners, who will each collect one million pounds or $1.4 million, will be announced at a ceremony on Sunday. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison says he will now attend the COP26 UN climate conference after weeks of initial hesitation. Let's cross over to other there in the world news special correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia for more. Yes, Anuradi. Global leaders will meet in Glasgow next month to negotiate a new deal to stall rising global temperatures. Prime Minister Morrison drew criticism when he indicated last month that he might skip the meeting. Australia, a large producer of coal and gas, is under pressure to commit to stronger climate action. Its climate policies and emissions reductions are ranked among the worst in the OECD. Morrison has said Australia wanted to achieve net zero as soon as possible and preferably by 2050. And it expects to beat its pledge to cut carbon emissions by 26% to 28% from 2005 levels by 2030. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister said that the easing of strict entry controls for vaccinated travellers returning from overseas to Sydney from November the 1st would initially benefit only citizens and permanent residents. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was other there in the World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. An FDA safety panel recommended Moderna's booster shot for people ages 65 and older and others at high risk for catching COVID because of health conditions or exposure at their job. Moving a major step toward authorization, tonight an FDA advisory panel says some Americans fully vaccinated with Moderna should get its booster. The unanimous recommendation, not yet greenlit by the CDC, applies to those 65 and older and others at higher risk of severe disease because of health conditions or exposure at their job. Providing documents full of data, Moderna argued the FDA should authorize its booster for recipients at least six months after their second dose, citing breakthrough infections and waning immunity over time. But the FDA notes even without a booster, vaccines still afford protection against severe COVID-19 disease and death in the United States. With nearly 70 million Americans already fully vaccinated with Moderna, those who qualify join the same group of Pfizer recipients who can also get a booster. With Moderna's original doses larger than Pfizer's, its third shot will be a half dose. Authorities saying today, the data are not perfect, but these are extraordinary times. Today, the president again making the sell for boosters. These boosters are free. I'll say it again, they're free, available, and convenient to get. As Johnson & Johnson's case for a booster comes up tomorrow, tonight for millions vaccinated with Moderna, the extra dose of protection may soon be a shot away. A factory in Italy is checking the COVID-19 Green Pass documentation of its employees as the country is set to make them mandatory to accelerate vaccinations and stamp out infections. Workers arriving for their shift at this factory in Italy's Umbria region on Thursday had their COVID-19 Green Pass documentation checked at the door. From Friday, all workers in the country will have to show it to confirm either proof of vaccination, a negative test or recent recovery from infection, making it one of the world's strictest coronavirus measures. Some politicians, unions and businesses fear the measure will cause shortages and disruptions rather than boost inoculations and output, as the government hopes. But at the ISA factory that makes refrigeration display cases for bars, restaurants and ice cream parlours, management are in favour of the measure. The management team have hired a security service to man entrances to the building and carry out tests for the workers. The Green Pass policy has the backing of a majority of Italians, according to polls. 
but it's also triggered angry demonstrations like these in Rome at the weekend. And workers who've declined to get vaccinated have threatened to block the major port of Trieste if it's not rescinded. A Danish man in custody in Norway is suspected of carrying out a bow and arrow attack which killed five people will appear in court. Officials named the suspect as Espen Andersen Brathen and said he is a Muslim convert. The man suspected of killing five people in Norway with a bow and arrow has been named as Espen Andersen Broughton. Police had concerns about signs of radicalisation and said the attack appears to have been an act of terror. A senior officer on Thursday said the suspect is a Danish convert to Islam. As previously announced, the suspect is a 37-year-old Danish national residing in Norway. Police have previously been in contact with the man in relation to trouble connected to radicalization. We haven't registered anything in regards to him in 2021, but had previously. Flags flew at half-mast across Kongsberg, where four women and a man were murdered. They were all aged between 50 and 70. Three people were also wounded in the attack on Wednesday evening. Police said the 37-year-old suspect was in custody and is believed to have acted alone. A relative of the suspect, who spoke on condition of anonymity to a Danish newspaper, described him as mentally ill and said the family had suffered threats for several years. The suspect's lawyer told public broadcaster NRK he was cooperating and giving detailed statements regarding the incident. The attack happened over a large area of Kongsberg, a town of about 28,000 people in southeast Norway. The death toll was the worst of any attack in Norway since 2011, when a far-right extremist killed 77 people. Tomorrow, October 16th, marks World Food Day. Before marking the occasion, the World Food Programme warns that humanity is facing a looming disaster. It says an extra 190 million more people will experience hunger if the international community fails to tackle the climate crisis. The UN's Food Assistance Branch is warning the Earth faces the possible risk of an exponential increase in hunger fueled by the climate crisis. Ahead of World Food Day on October 16th, the World Food Program released a study that shows a two degree Celsius rise in the average global temperature from pre industrial levels will lead to 189 million more people going hungry. It adds the world's most vulnerable communities, those that rely on agriculture, fishing, and livestock, who contribute the least to emissions, will continue to bear the brunt of the climate crisis. One example the WFP notes is the southern part of Madagascar, where famine-like conditions have been driven by climate change. The region has been experiencing consecutive droughts that have pushed nearly 1.1 million people into severe hunger. Some 14,000 are currently suffering famine-like conditions, with this number expected to double by the end of the year. The WFP is currently providing help to communities so they can adapt to the changing climate that threatens their ability to grow food, secure income, and ultimately withstand shocks. So far, it says it has helped 39 governments realize their national climate ambitions. The organization also says conflict is also plunging millions of people into hunger, but the climate crisis could soon become the main cause of hunger. Welcome back. And for more world news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Canada and France plan to deploy patrol aircrafts to discourage illegal ship-to-ship -ship transfers by North Korea. Japan's foreign ministry said that Canada's aircraft to patrol for about a month using Japan's Kadena Air Base to monitor illicit maritime activities. Disney Plus is coming to South Korea on November 12th with a wide array of contents old and new. The OTT platform will offer content from iconic brands such as Disney, Pixar and Marvel Studios. Former US President Bill Clinton has been receiving hospital treatment in California for a non-COVID related infection. Clinton's physician said in a statement that he is responding well to antibiotic treatment but will remain hospitalized for monitoring. Thousands of Afghan evacuees are waiting at a U.S. military base in Midwestern state of Indiana to be resettled into local communities across the United States. Microsoft is shutting down LinkedIn in China nearly seven years after its launch and will replace it with a stripped-down version from the platform that will focus only on jobs.
And finally tonight, one of South Africa's most popular sports is now accessible to people with disabilities. A new chair made in France now allows everyone to try the adventure. South Africa is one of the best paragliding destinations in the world and Cape Town attracts thousands of paragliders every year. Now this thrilling sport is accessible to more people. 38-year-old Taryn Tomlinson lost the use of her legs when she suffered from rheumatoid arthritis in her final year of school. But this didn't tie her down, it just propelled her to new heights. Ultimately, it's your attitude that determines your altitude in life. And that, you know, we can, even persons with disabilities can get to the top of the mountain if we have help, if we have people around us that are willing to go with us, then we can open up the world to so many more people to experience. Tomlinson assesses hotels and tourism facilities accessibility for disabled people. Paragliding is extremely challenging without being able to jump or land on your feet. Matthew Van Sale imported this adaptable paragliding wheelchair from France. Nice rugged wheel, so it allows for, for us to tackle any kind of terrain. So this acts as a roll cage so that your head and your shoulders are completely safe. I can now manipulate the chair with my feet to keep you in the right position. Or it could be used as a solo pilot for instance if you want to go flying by yourself we'll strap you in and you get your own safety harness this week Tomlinson tried out the new kit I cannot wait to get out there and just like experience what it's like to see Cape Town from above Bye. <laughs> It was absolutely nothing as scary as what I anticipated it to be. So I am I'm super thrilled. <laughs> I can just see it. Now that international tourism is picking up, Cape Town is ready to welcome international visitors of all abilities this summer. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. I'll be back again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Anradi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great weekend.